In this episode of Crypto Over Coffee, we're talking about some top altcoins that could do really, really well in a renewed bull market, which I think we are approaching. Now we're going to talk about what those coins are, what the fundamentals or narratives or both that are going to drive them to potential success in a crypto bull market. And then we're going to touch on what you can do to maximize what profits you may make in this bull market by selling at the right time. That is the most important thing, not round tripping the altcoins that you buy, buying them, riding them up, saying, wow, I made so much money and then writing it down for a major loss, which is what a lot of people do in crypto bull markets as they come to an end. So we're going to talk about all that. Plus, we're going to touch on the thought of an Ethereum or Ether ETF. A lot of people have been messaging me asking me why I think it may or may not be approved and what that timeline looks like. So we're going to talk about those things. Let's go ahead and get started with some top altcoins. Some of these that are more prevalent. This is not a low cap or even small cap, mid cap type of video. This is a well-established altcoin video talking about cryptocurrencies, mostly from years past that I think are going to have a successful time in a renewed bull market whenever that is. So we're not going to talk about when I think the bull market's going to start up. We'll have another video about that, so make sure you're subscribed. But the first altcoin that I want to talk about in this particular segment is one that I think is in a weird spot right now, and that is Polygon. And there's a lot of sort of mixed signal from people about Polygon. There are a lot of people right now that say, hey, listen, Polygon's volume especially in some of the key areas, you know, looking at DeFi, et cetera. It's been kind of choppy. You've seen sort of a downtrend. It's not competing with a lot of the other sort of EVM chains, even some of the L2s. And it's definitely falling behind in terms of, uh, you know, interest and volume against something like a Solana. And people say, well, what's differentiated about Polygon? And this is exactly where I want to point to. Polygon has amassed in the last several years, even during the last bull market, what I think to be the pieces that they need for success in future bull markets. It looked to me like from a technology perspective, they were preparing for the next cycle right at near the peak of the last one. So in that 2021, 2022 period, Polygon was amassing talent in the zero knowledge proofs area. They were bringing in technical talent, they were acquiring existing technology, and they were working on what I believe is a really winning strategy in a, an L2-focused Ethereum ecosystem, and that is to have all the little tools and technologies that they need to build a really strong Ethereum virtual machine compatible or EVM equivalent um, ZK rollup. Not only that, but allow various different app chains to be built with their technology. So you see this release of Polygon Chain Development Kit or Polygon CDK that is focused on onboarding a bunch of different types of businesses, a bunch of different types of um, projects to the Ethereum ecosystem and to the Polygon ecosystem. The other thing that I think is really important to note is that Polygon is really good at incubating and bringing up bigger projects, ones that start small, they build, they build, they build, they get the tools they need, they get funding they might need, etc. from the Polygon space, and then they grow and they explode. And I think that is something to look for in this particular next cycle. It's going to be things like gaming that start to thrive on Polygon and its sort of true layer twos, the ZK EVM, etc. And you're going to see a much better integration of all these different pieces of the puzzle for Polygon, but Polygon proof of stake, ZK EVM, you know, sort of purpose built Polygon, CDK, app chain, ZK rollups. You have all of these things working in concert together to address use cases like gaming. And I think that those are the things that can drive Polygon forward. And the thing is, is that you may not hear as much about these things because these are technical things. Uh, you're not going to see Polygon doing a bunch of threads on technology because to be quite honest with you, not many people care and not many people are going to really think about that. Oh, well, this enables that and think three, four steps down the road. Polygon hasn't 
had the traction in the early phase of this excitement around the ETF. And so, so some people say, okay, well, Polygon is dead. It's not going to come back. This bull market or the last bull market was the last one where Polygon's really going to thrive. And I don't really agree with that. What I think people are going to see is you're going to start to see the vision for the Ethereum ecosystem over the next probably year and a half to two years start to unfold a little bit more. And the competition amongst layer one or even layer twos in the broader EVM space and then even outside of EVMs, you're going to see that heating up. And that's where Polygon is going to be right in the mix, sort of duking it out, especially with some of the other L2s. People say, can it compete against Arbitrum, Optimism, who are doing really well right now in the optimistic roll-up space? And I think they actually can. Um, and it's not just because of uh, fees, because obviously those optimistic roll-ups have a fee advantage. But I think the technology that Polygon has has not been fully realized yet. And that's going to really propel it forward. So we shall see. Let me know in the comments what you think about Polygon. I know there are some concerns on the fundamentals and narrative side, but I think maybe those things are a little misplaced. So let me know what you think. I'd be curious to hear it. The second project that I want to talk about with you today is Multiverse X, uh, otherwise known as, well, formerly known as Elrond. Now, in the last, I don't know, four years or so, I've covered Elrond quite a bit, now Multiverse X. And I've talked a lot about some of the fundamentals that make it a unique and compelling project, right? We talk about scalability through sharding. To be honest with you, sharding with a D, not T with a T, or sharding with a T, well, what am I talking about? I'm sure I'll get that comment in the comment section. Is basically a mechanism by which um, blockchain networks can achieve higher scalability, basically handling more transaction throughput We'll just oversimplify it in that case without going too deeply into what it is and how it works. I have videos about that on the channel, by the way. One of the things that I've always pointed to is that Multiverse X has really never gotten a chance to stretch its legs and really show off that transaction throughput. And one of the reasons for that is because I think all the way, like right up until the last bull market, it was still realizing a lot of the technical roadmap, just getting the original vision in place for the project. Towards the end of the bull market, it was really starting to catch its stride. And you started to see more projects building on it, but it just didn't quite get there in terms of the volume and in terms of realizing all of the growth potential that it had. I think this time around, this bull market is a perfect opportunity in a very, very open layer one blockchain fight or blockchain race for Multiverse X to really start to, to push forward and take advantage of some of its technical advantages. Now, you also see Multiverse X diving into the world of app chains, so very application specific. Um, you could call them shards in this block in this overall blockchain ecosystem, natively compatible with the main Multiverse X chain without bridges, which is very important. Bridges, in my opinion, are a liability. They are not a sustainable path forward for the space. You cannot have all these heterogeneous bridges connecting different ecosystems because there's always trust assumptions you make with bridges. But anyway, I digress. I think that the sovereign um, shard idea is something that people need to be looking out for, still flying under the radar. The other thing is, broadly speaking, Multiverse X is a great user experience. The MyR wallet, which I think is now called uh, X Portal, if I'm not mistaken, due to the rebrand. And I will say, I'm not the biggest fan of the rebrand, the like Multiverse X thing, X Portal, etc. Like, yeah, it's okay, I guess, but it's a little too metaversey for me. But that's just my opinion. People don't have to uh, to agree with me. It has nothing to do with the fundamentals of the project, but figured I would shout that out. Going back to the fundamentals of, of Multiverse X for a second. The other thing is the take on smart contracts and the take on bringing in developers, in my opinion, is something that not enough people are talking about. Now, I've seen the community around Multiverse X doing basically full court press on calling out the design flaws or design issues with the Ethereum virtual machine and the prevalent standards like ERC-20, which really it's not much of a debate because those things are just simply 
factual. Now, there are ways that those things could be fixed. Not everyone agrees with that. Uh, that's a video for another day. But the multiverse X approach to a virtual machine or to execution of smart contracts in a blockchain environment is one that takes a lot of lessons learned from the EVM and improves on that model quite a bit. So you have you know, pre-compilation, uh, you have the ability to upgrade smart contracts, and you also have something that I think is very interesting in this space, and that is the ability to write contracts in a bunch of different languages, ones that people are already used to, which is much appreciated. So uh, WebAssembly or Wasm virtual machine. And the last thing I'll mention is bringing in developers, because you know if you watch this channel, I say it all the time, for a successful layer one blockchain in particular, you need to build for builders. You need to welcome builders into your space. You need to create documentation and tools for them. They need to be mature. You need to have incentives and programs and funding, et cetera, for people to build on your chain because this space is built so much around user acquisition or customer acquisition, whatever you want to call it, bringing users into the space. But there's not enough focus being placed on the thing that keeps users there, which is good quality dApps, opportunity, things to do, things to play with, things to build with, and things to make money with. That is the issue that we have today, is it's basically people fighting airdrop, fighting over airdrops, moving from one space to the other and farming, and it's work. But the issue with that is that you're acquiring these users and they're not staying, and that is a big problem. So I think Elrond, or I can't get away from calling it Elrond just because that's what it was always before. Multiverse X has something that I think is very interesting. Very few people are maybe aware of that outside of that, uh, that community. And that is sort of subsidies, basically fees for executions of smart contracts or for dApps go to developers. So you have sort of a mechanism for developers to be incentivized, not only to build something, but to maintain that thing, uh, keep the volume going. And I think that's a really interesting incentive model that I would like to see start to to get fleshed out a little more in terms of narratives that multiverse x can really capture market share around i think DeFi is one that they could do some damage on and i think it's because with enough liquidity and i think stable coins are the first step right maybe getting in on a couple of stable coins i know people love or hate usdc that may be a compelling opportunity for them getting integrated into um, different platforms, maybe as a payment method, the X portal wallet has a lot of great plugins and tools. I think it would be really straightforward to get it integrated into a, a forum or a bunch of, or even a, a video platform. Uh, some people are speculating that it might be integrated with a social media platform here. We shall see. I also think that the, uh, sort of metaverse and gaming area could apply here as well as uh, some of the stuff around decentralized social, because like I said, that X portal wallet, and there's a sort of fundamental identity primitives there. I think they could do something there. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with multiverse X, but I think a lot of the fundamentals are in place for them to do really well. What I would say is focus on bringing in developers, building cool things that bring in users and keeps them there. Now, one sort of space or one ecosystem that People either love or hate again, um, and this is not necessarily an endorsement. This is a video about altcoins ecosystems that I think are going to do well. And one that I think is going to do well, despite the hate and despite those who love it, despite those who hate it, is Solana. They're really good at this. The thing that I just said, it's incentivizing builders, bringing people in, creating volume, creating hype, and whether people think it's fake or real, there's been some issues in the past with fake volume, et cetera. You can say, oh, the chain's not reliable. It can be shut down. All of that is true. All of that is true. I think Solana has a lot of work to do on the technology side. However, what they're really good at is uh, building that hype around their, their chain and bringing in and incubating projects who build things that people want to use, you also see, uh, you know, airdrop farming, which is very prevalent on Solana. You know my feelings about that. Last week, my video was all about how airdrops are not such a great thing. Even if it takes work for you to get them, you're not building sort of a meaningful community around your, your application unless your app is really darn good. And in that case, you probably don't really need an airdrop anyway. But I digress. 
Solana has a lot of the, the makings of a successful chain from a fundamental uh, and narratives perspective. And people don't necessarily want to hear that. There's a reason why it did so well in the last bull market. It's because people are running away from high fees. Even in the Ethereum ecosystem, going to L2s does not always solve the problem for people. People especially retail users that are entering the space for the first time. They want quality user experience, which Solana, in my opinion, has, and they want low fees and they want to be able to make money as quickly as possible. Uh, Solana has done a lot of those things. Some of that is in their control. Some of it's not. The other thing that they do really well is they drive a lot of programs in the space around um, the it's hard to it's hard to articulate it's around building an exclusive yet ubiquitous experience it's something that apple does really well right so it's even though everyone has an iphone or everyone has an ipad apple makes you feel like what you have is truly special and i think that solana does that really well and that's not a technology thing that's a marketing thing. And same thing with those phones, right? Whoever decided to do the phone, I think the hardware part is ridiculous. Whoever decided to tie experiences to that phone is the genius. It's tying airdrops. It's tying access to beta betas. It's tying access to certain applications. It's tying a wallet to a piece of hardware. All of these things are really good at bringing in retail users. So if we're talking about fundamental technology that I think blows me away, Solana is not it. But if I think of, a, of an ecosystem that's going to do well because it really knows how to cater to users and really knows how to build a community around things, then you can't argue that Solana is going to continue to do well. And there's a reason why it did so well during the Bitcoin ETF hype cycle, which we're now sort of coming out of. But that's the thing you have to think about is whether you like it or not, I think there is potential there in a bull market in particular because money goes where it's cheap to use and easy to use and where there's a lot of narrative and there is a lot of narrative in Solana across pretty much every major um, crypto narrative you can think of. Uh, decentralized physical infrastructure, a deep in, you've got gaming projects like Star Atlas are really well built, uh, incredible stuff that I've seen so far. Uh, strong team, in my opinion. You have DeFi all over the place. Whether you like it or not, there's meme coins all over the place. And that is the makings of a successful project in the bull market. Uh, again, love it or hate it. Speaking of uh, uh, the meme coins thing, what I think is really interesting, and this is bringing me to the next project here, and this may be the last one because I got to get my, my son up from his nap, but this project one that I've talked about on the channel a ton, Cardano. This is one of the most shocking things that I've seen in this space in a while. If you look at the top coins by, by volume, by social volume, by, uh, by almost every account, meme coins are dominating on Cardano. And that is something I did not think was going to happen. But now that I'm thinking about it again, just this morning I was thinking about it, it actually kind of makes sense. So while a lot of the, the Cardano community is basically two separate communities now, and I've started to see this over the, the bear market because things got a little bit, I would say, nasty at times, and that kind of bothers me. But anyways, there's the sort of deeply technical or more tech-focused community, and then there's the true sort of like retail crypto community. And there's neither, neither one is better than the other, okay? So I'm not saying that one is better than the other. On the tech side, right, it can be a little pedantic, preachy, you know, preaching fundamentals all the time. Oh, meme coins shouldn't exist, whatever. Fine. And you have the retail side who really, they just want the chain to work. They want things to be built there. They want stable coins. They want DeFi. They want meme coins. They want the, the ecosystem to be spun up and to do all the things that people love about crypto. They want the same, you know, whether they hate on Solana or not, they want that sort of Solana experience of being able to dive into, a, you know, DeFi degen projects. They want to be able to buy meme coins and chase those around on, on, uh, on DEXs. They want all this stuff. 
And now Cardano is starting to get there because people are building on it. And now there's a whole debate around, do we want Cardano native stable coins or do we want USDC? Why can't we have both and let the market decide? Those are the types of things that I think are interesting about Cardano. That community contention now is the foundation of governance. That is the thing that's missing from Cardano is it needs to be governed by the community. And my humble opinion, IOHK, IOG need to finish the work that they've, they've planned and they need to step out of the community governance space and really hand everything over to the community. And people say, oh, they already have. Not really, not really. There needs to be client diversity for, from the technology perspective. Of course, you've got the layer twos and stuff popping up. There's been controversy around the uh, midnight situation. I don't think it's all that big of a deal. Uh, you've got Hydra, you've got all these foundational components, not so unlike Multiverse X, right? You have wildly different decisions that have been made at the foundations of the smart contract, um, the smart contract area or smart contract uh, virtual machine, etc. You have really different decision making there. You have com a completely different uh, data structure underneath uh, for, the, for the blockchain, which is uh, the extended UTXO model, uh, EUTXO. And I have a whole video about that. So I'm trying to maybe uh, save time by not going too deeply into it. But you have native assets, which is fairly unique. You have a completely different smart contract environment. You have a completely different model for how layer twos are going to interact with your chain. You have a native scaling solution in Hydra, an isomorphic state channel based scaling solution, which I think addresses the majority of the sort of side channel type of uh, transaction volume that Cardano is going to need. I think the scalability is there. So to me, I think now the main thing is you have to in this next cycle, because Cardano missed out on it last time because smart contracts didn't come until too late in the game. You need to win developer mindshare. You need to make it easier to build on Cardano. You need to invest in the tools and documentation and training and upskilling developers. You need to, if IOHK is going to be involved, they need to sponsor the living crap out of developers to build cool things on Cardano. That is how you're going to start to set it on its way to where it needs to be. People's criticism of Cardano is it's too slow. It's a ghost chain, as in too slow to build, not too slow from throughput. It's a ghost chain. No one's building anything on it. Nothing's meaningful. No, nothing's done that's meaningful on there. And that's, I think, in the community's control to demand that those things be prioritized. Um, and to me, if Cardano can really get builders building unique and differentiated things on the chain, things are going to be really good for Cardano in a bull market. You will get people to come to to use Cardano. Uh, and I think there's a little bit more work needs to be done on the wallet side of things as well. I kind of went back and started from scratch. Like as a new user of Cardano, what would I do? And I think that the selection of different wallets that are out there and the usability of them is uh, meh. I, I think it, it there needs to be some work done on that. But that's a nitpick. I think you can get there. Cardano, it's a project I've been a fan of for a long time. Its community is its greatest asset. And I think it's a little fractured right now based on sort of those two divisions that I talked about before. But they can come together for the best interest of the chain with governance and really move it forward. Because through that contention, I think you'll solve some of the problems that are there. The last thing I'll say on, the, on, on Cardano is that with Cardano, people's biggest uh, complaint is it takes too long to build and deliver things. And I think now is the opportunity to change that. In the last cycle, Cardano broke $3 and some change. Maybe it was like $320, $350, etc. without much volume. And it could do incredibly well with a lot of volume and with a lot of capital flowing in. So just food for thought. That's the way that I'm thinking about this. Um, and the one thing I will also say is that when I talk about these projects, it's not just the single asset that I'm talking about for Cardano or for Multiverse X or for Solana or for Polygon. It's also the projects that build on those chains. It's looking deeply at those and sort of matching up narratives to the fundamental technologies that are provided by these chains 
and using those to build an investment thesis. And within that investment thesis, it's not only how to make an entry, it's how to make a profit and then how to keep that profit. So that's what we're going to talk about here is let's see how we're doing on time. 25 minutes. All right. So I'm going to make this quick. To keep your profits, you need to make a plan. And I talk about this every year on the channel, especially during bull markets. And people made fun of me a ton in the last bull market when I said, take profits, sell your Cardano over to $3, sell some. People were like, why would I sell? It's going to five. It didn't. So if you sold, you made a profit, right? So that's what you need to do. You need to make a plan. You say, I buy into Polygon at, let's say, 86 cents, okay? I buy into to, to, uh, Matic, soon to be Paul or P-O-L, at 86 cents. When am I going to start to take money off the table? When it hits what, according to my thesis? Or say I bought Beam, Beam OS, a gaming coin that I like, right? Let's say I bought that. When do I start rolling profits and taking, you know, taking some money off the table? Maybe it's, I want after a 20% gain, I'm going to take my principal off the table. That way, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I'm golden. You still have enough exposure that you can, you know, ride. If, if it does a 10 X, you're still exposed, right? Those are the types of things that you need to be thinking about. The other thing is you need to be monitoring the social traffic. You need to be looking at the position of that coin in the hype cycle. When you see a coin adding, you know, 10%, 20%, 30%, hundreds of percents in market cap, and you see social volume just climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. When you get to a certain point, you need to start saying, is this sustainable? You ask yourself that question, is this sustainable? And your brain's going to tell you it is because it's greedy. It wants to make more money. But the sensible, reasonable side of yourself will say, but what if it's not? What in your mind, you need to ask yourself, what is going to cause this number in terms of, uh, you know, the, the social traffic or market cap addition, what's going to cause this to continue? What is going to drive this and catalyze this growth? And if you can't think of that and you can't really create a reasonable um, hypothesis for why, that may be the time that you start to think about taking some profits off the table. And that's a really important thing for people to think about. Really important thing for people to focus on. And we don't do anything related to financial advice on this channel. We all know that. But in this case, all I'm, in, all I'm asking for you to do is to have a plan so that when you make profits, and you probably will in a bull market, right? When you make profits, you keep them. And that's the most important part. So if, if you know, when I hit this percentage, percentage of a game, I'm taking money off the table. If I hit this, I'm taking more. And if I hit this point, maybe I take it all off, right? That's what you need to be doing, thinking about when you make your plan. So I'm gonna do a whole video about this and maybe I'll do a practical example where I buy some altcoin, hopefully it does well and I can show you the profit taking strategy and we'll follow it throughout. I'll have to think about how to execute on that, but maybe I will do that. How to make a plan for a coin when you, when you make an entry, what do you do? At least what do I do? So anyways, let's also talk about the Ethereum ETF business. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, is this a thing? Is this going to happen? Well, the latest update is the SEC has deferred the decision, which is not surprising. Uh, the SEC took a major loss on approving a Bitcoin ETF in spot, and there's no question about it. You saw the salty responses from uh, from Gary Gensler, for for example, from Chair Chair Gary Gensler, and some of his colleagues. We all know that that was not a perceived as a win for the SEC, and the SEC really had to do it because of a loss in court against Grayscale. Now, people say that because of that court case against Grayscale, the Ethereum or Ether spot ETF is also a shoe in It's a guaranteed win. Now, a lot of people are basing that off of this assumption that the previous statements made by um, members of the SEC um, that Ether is not a security will hold, right? So it's under the same model of Bitcoin, Ether would be approved. 
And I just don't think that that's going to happen. I actually think this is going to be another battle to get an Ether ETF in spot approved. And that's mostly because there's a battle around the distribution of Ether, which was a coin offering. It was the first coin offering, but it was a coin offering. People could argue that that offering makes it a security. People could also argue that proof of stake, the mere model by which network moves, moves itself forward is something that makes Ether a security. Now, I don't agree with either of those statements, but this is the battle that's going to have to be fought. And I don't think that it's been fought yet. What's happening right now is in the courts, the case with Coinbase is a big one. Now, the XRP case, the, the Ripple case, was significant. And that could be invoked potentially in a, a battle about an Ether ETF because it did come up a, a couple of times in that. The problem that I have is that the SEC does not want to approve an Ether ETF. And so it is not going to, in my opinion, just make a compromise and say, okay, well, sure, we lost on the Bitcoin one, so we may as well just do the Ether one. They're going to fight it until the last second, until there are no options left to fight it. That's my humble opinion. So what does that mean? Do I think we will get an Ether spot ETF? The answer is yes, I do. I think enough of the big players like BlackRock, for example, they're not going to take no for an answer and they will eventually win that fight. When will they win that fight is a bigger question. And another big question is what happens when a ton of ether supply lands in the hands of large financial institutions, um, BlackRock, for example, you know, there are people now concerned about how much Bitcoin simply just BlackRock, let alone its contemporaries that offer other spot ETF products have. It's a lot of units. I think they own single digit percentage of the supply of Bitcoin and the ETFs only been around for a matter of weeks. People are concerned about this. And this is not as simple as ETF approved number go up forever. It's not really like that. This is a very complex issue. And I think people should not be in a huge rush to push forward with ETFs because you're sort of throwing sharks in the fish tank where we don't really know what's going to happen. And I would say the retail investor should be the most skeptical about this whole thing because look at the equities markets. The retail investor does not have an advantage in the equities markets. They are owned and run by Wall Street and these big financial institutions. So we're welcoming them into this space happily thinking, oh, well, that means number goes up and means that I'm going to win. I, I, again, history shows us maybe that that's not the case. So I would just say, take this with a huge grain of salt, this, this thought that the Ether ETF is just a, a home run, it's a shoe in it's going to happen and it's going to happen soon. It will probably happen, but I don't think it's going to happen soon. Uh, and if it does, it's going to be the result of court decisions, judge decisions that give the SEC no choice but to approve it. You saw the dissent around the Bitcoin ETF approval from a couple of members of the SEC. And that dissent is going to be even louder with something like Ether, in my humble opinion, on the basis of a variety of things, but most notably its status potentially as a security in the eyes of the SEC, uh, as well as uh, the prevalence of other altcoins and exposure to altcoins that are tacitly uh, sort of Ponzi scheme securities, like the ICO boom, there will be some challenges in there. So we talked about a lot of stuff today. We covered a lot of ground, talked about some of the ecosystems that I'm thinking are going to be successful in this next bull market and the reasons why. If you agree with me, let me know why in the comments. If you disagree with me, let me know why in the comments. Keep it civil. But uh, I'm going to come back with another video uh, fairly soon, something that's uh, a little bit more uh, structured around narratives and coins within each of those narratives that fit different market cap levels that I'm looking at. Again, not telling you to buy these coins, nor am I telling you to buy these coins today, but I'm going to come back with that video. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're following the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thanks very much. I hope you had a great time watching this video or listening to this podcast today. Hope you and your family have a great rest of your weekend. Have a great one. Cheers.